So let's start our second week off uh, by with a review of what we, uh, the short amount of material we looked at last time. Uh, we had just been introduced to uh, a particular functional group and we're going into more detail on it, that of the alkane functional group, uh, characterized by carbon-carbon single bonds and uh, the electron geometry about the uh, carbon atoms in an alkane is tetrahedral. Um, we looked at some uh, examples of, what, of, uh, of alkanes, know, and why they are considered saturated hydrocarbons. It's because depending on the number of carbons that we, uh, that we have, it is the most, uh, the, the, the greatest number of possible carbons that, uh, or, sorry, hydrogens that can attach to that particular carbon. So we found that alkanes are considered saturated hydrocarbons, while alkenes and alkynes which we'll look at in another unit, are considered unsaturated hydrocarbons. Um, lastly, or we finished off with looking at general physical properties of alkanes. We found that they were typically unreactive molecules. They were nonpolar and typically not, uh, not soluble in water. So um, coming from the standpoint of organic chemistry, we look at uh, more uh, at structures as opposed to uh, uh, chemical formulas. So with these, uh, the fact that we're looking at structures more often, we uh, have some, some new sort of uh, uh, ideas of uh, what we need to explore. Um, the first of these are going to be what I'm going to call constitutional isomers. So let's think of two different alkane hydrocarbons, two different compounds have different chemical and physical properties. Um, they, Compounds can be different, or let's look at, think about uh, single bonded hydrocarbons. We can have two different single bonded hydrocarbons, uh, but that they can be related somehow. Um, and so many different carbon compounds can be related as what we're looking at here as constitutional isomers, constitutional isomers. Uh, the uh, definition of which are compounds with the same molecular formula, in the case of our alkanes would just be carbon and hydrogen, same CH formula, but different structures, different structures, meaning different carbon connectivity, carbon connectivity. Now we know that if we have, uh, if we have a, uh, a hydrocarbon, it's, it's, uh, an alkane hydrocarbon that is non-cyclic, if we can count the number of carbons, we can count the number of hydrogens. Remember that 2n plus 2 rule. And uh, as long as we have two compounds, two alkanes that have the same number of carbons and are non-cyclic, they will have the same number of hydrogens too, 2n plus 2. No matter how those carbons are put together, as long as there's not a cycle in there, it's going to be 2n plus 2 hydrogens. Same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens. So, but they don't have to be the same compounds. Why? Because they would have a, uh, a different, uh, uh, different uh, carbon connectivity. Let's look at an example. So C4H10, uh, now there's actually two ways we can put together C4H10. Um, and if I can string together uh, four, uh, four carbons, here's one way to string four carbons together in this linear uh, fashion, but there's another way I can put together four carbons and that's uh, in this kind of fashion right here, the way we see this. Now, since there's no cycles in these, we know that there's four carbons, we can immediately know the number of hydrogens, 2n plus 2. 2 times 4 plus 2 is 10. So it has, to, no matter how we decorate these hydrogens on there, uh, we, uh, as long as it's a, a, they're non-cyclic or they, they, they don't have cycles in them, we would have C4H10, but they're different compounds. So while these are different compounds, they are related as constitutional isomers. So let's go, uh, let's build up a, a number of uh, carbon compounds all the way from one carbon uh, up to six carbons and see where this concept of constitutional isomers comes into play. So notice uh, I, over on the left-hand side here, I have my molecular formula, CH4, C2H6, C3H8, and so on. We go up uh, each time with respect to the number of, uh, of carbons, one, two, three, 
uh, four, and, and so on. And we have the attendant number of hydrogens uh, decorated on there to satisfy that 2n plus 2 rule. So we don't uh, truck very hard in organic chemistry with uh, molecular formulas. We go towards molecular structure, the, the actual carbon connectivities. So let's look at that. The first one here, CH4, how is that put together? Well, there's only one structure possible on that, carbon in the middle, uh, rule of four around it, having four bonds emanating from it, that would have four hydrogens on it. There's one structure possible. Let's look at the next one. If I had two carbons, so we're going to de be dealing with single bonded alkane hydrocarbons here, two carbons, well, uh, we, there's one structure possible in that too. There's only two way or one way to put two carbons together. The same would be said with three carbons. How many ways can I put together three carbons? And I'm going to move over now uh, eventually to the, uh, as we get more complex, to line structure. But this is the last one where we'll be looking at the complete bonding structure. Well, we have only one way to put together three carbons in that sort of uh, zigzag V formation there. There's only one way to do it. It's a linear way. Now we saw in the last slide that there are now more than one way to put together four carbons. As we increase in carbon size, our options become greater and greater for forming a greater degree of complexity of that connectivity. And we found that with four carbons, C4H10, that 2n plus 2 rule, we can, there's two ways that we can put this together. Notice, um, um, uh, right now I'm uh, omitting the hydrogens on these, even though they're supposed to be there uh, for clarity. So I'm just putting in the carbons uh, in there. And we found that, as, as shown on the previous slide, there's two ways to put that together. Thus, there are two constitutional isomers possible. At four carbons is the first time that we see the potential for constitutional isomers. One carbon, two carbon, three carbon, there's only one way to put it together, uh, so we, we can't have a, a pair of constitutional isomers. Starting at four carbons, yes. Then we can have uh, a diversity of ways to start putting these together. Now let's look at five carbons. If I have, how many ways can I connect together five different carbons? And the best way to do this is to just get a piece of paper and start drawing them. There is no uh, trick like the 2n plus 2 rule or, or that sort of thing to be able to figure this out. It's all trial and error. So uh, let's, there are three ways we find to put together uh, five carbons. And notice I always start with that linear chain that linear chain right there. And then I start to pluck off uh, end carbons and put them in the middle or something like that so that I can uh, now uh, diversify my connectivity uh, of ways of putting this together. Again, this is all arrived at using trial and error. This is, simply is. Um, uh, there is no trick to, uh, to learning that. But here are the three ways of putting together uh, uh, five carbons with the hydrogens purposely omitted just so it's easier to see those uh, the, the ways in which we can put those five carbons together. And we'll, uh, we'll look at one more example because the uh, potential for constitutional isomers really takes off geometrically uh, as we increase the carbon number by one, two, three more. Um, and it really gets to be just uh, an undoable task with just a few more carbons uh, being, being added to that chain. But we'll look at six. And we find that with six carbons, uh, again, we're talking about what types of al alkanes can we put together with this? We find that there are five constitutional isomers possible. Again, starting with the, uh, all the carbons uh, connected together in a linear fashion, and then we start to form possible branches uh, on there, how we can put these together. Now, it is important when you're working with these, uh, it's a little difficult to show in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, over a, a video, but understand, and let, let me uh, clean this up a little bit, look down here on the bottom. Um, what if we looked at something like this, this one right here, and what if we flipped it around 180 degrees? Well, that would put this carbon branch here over to the other side. And we'd have to recognize that those are two different ways of expressing the same compound. So we have to be, have to be clear on this and how this, uh, uh, th these 
organic structures uh, are, 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 are affected, sometimes two uh, compounds might look different, but they're not constitutional isomers. They're actually identical compounds. We'll look at some examples uh, of that as we, as we move along. Suffice to say that I'm not gonna go above six when we're talking about how many constitutional isomers would say uh, a, a compound of 10 carbons be with you know, all carbon, carbon, single bonds. Then it just gets crazy. And we're, we're, it just gets out of the realm of, uh, uh, of learning and, in, and really into the realm of, of, of just really not understanding it because it gets too complex. But let's uh, let's look at that. Let's how could uh, something like this be put into a uh, perhaps a, a a problem or something like that that, that we would have to uh, we would have have to look at. So here we see uh, three uh, three piece three uh, pairs of of uh, compounds together. They're written in line structure. These are the the carbon connectivities, and we want to be able to identify the pair or pairs of constitutional isomer or, or, and ident also, or otherwise identify pairs as identical compounds. So let's look at this first one over here. Now remember, the uh, first of all, I can show you uh, a carbon compound writ, uh, drawn, the same carbon compound drawn 180 degree disposed, so it looks sort of different. Also, now remember that these carbon-carbon single bonds all allow for free rotation around the carbon-carbon bonds. All of them uh, we have to take into account, and that's going to come into the potential for uh, these compounds to look different, perhaps thinking they're uh, constitutional isomers, but in fact they're just another way of disposing the same compound. That is indeed the case with uh, our first one right here. We find that these two are identical compounds. They are identical compounds. And we're gonna get into a nomenclature system which ultimately shows that. But if we uh, had to uh, start out sort of rudimentarily, how could we uh, understand that these are identical compounds? Well, I'm going to pick out, and this is how we're gonna do it when we look at nomenclature, sort of a, a parent structure, the longest continuous carbon chain. And notice that this branch on there is on the third carbon in from either side. Well, I could do the same thing now with this other one. One, two, three, four, five, that's the longest continuous carbon chain, and still say, well, on the third carbon in from either side, I have that uh, one carbon branch. That's one way of describing it, and it would be accurate. Uh, an accurate way of, de of describing it. We'll uh, codify this when we start looking at actual ways of, uh, of naming compounds, naming these carbon compounds, but that's essentially what we just did. We described both of them. If that description matches, no matter how they look or how they're disposed, they must be the same compound. Let's look at the second one. Uh, so we have this second one over here. Let's do what we did before. Um, are, are these identical compounds or are they constitutional isomers? Some of you may be able to pick it out like that. Sometimes, myself included, when I was sitting in your seat, I had to agonize over it sometimes and it get, you get it with practice. So in this case, let's look at this. Well, we could say we have sort of a parent structure here of five carbons with a one carbon branch right there, but that one carbon branch is, is on a second carbon in from an end. Fair enough. The next one, the longest continuous carbon chain, got to be a little careful to test all possibilities, uh, would be uh, this one right here. And we do indeed have a branch, but this branch is two carbons in. Different connectivity. Same molecular formula, different connectivity. So these must be related as constitutional isomers. So you see where I'm going here. We have to uh, approach this in, uh, in sort of a, a standard fashion. Again, they can get a little more complex. Let's look at uh, this third uh, series right here. The longest continuous carbon chain, we could put as this one, right? These six carbons here. And we indeed have two branches, two one carbon branches. And they happen to be at the third and the fourth carbon in. If you, if you analyze this, you count in car, okay, there's one, one carbon branch at the third and one carbon branch at the fourth. Keep that in mind. 
We'll do the same thing with the other one. Written suggestively here, you know, here's the longest continuous carbon chain. It's the same number of carbons. And we have, again, two one carbon branches. And if you count one, two, three, oh, we have that, those one carbon branches are the third and fourth carbon in. Identical connectivity must be identical compounds. So this is how we would look at this. Again, we'll codify this later into a language of nomenclature, but uh, for right now, it is important to be able to discern between these. Uh, are they constitutional isomers? Are they identical compounds? So that was a very good springboard <clears throat> for the introduction of uh, nomenclature of organic compounds. Specifically, we're going to start with the nomenclature for alkanes, and we're going to find out that naming these alkane compounds are going to be important because these alkane compounds or alkane structure typically uh, provides the foundation or the, the general overall architecture of a uh, of a particular compound. And later on, we're going to be throwing in other functional groups upon it, like alkenes and amines and aldehydes and so on. But this starts us off a foundational nomenclature uh, way of looking at things. Now, we have sort of a, a, a funny way uh, of putting that, that IUPAC or UPAC way of uh, no, naming or have a nomenclature system for alkanes. IUPAC is, a, is, a, is, a, is an abbreviation are really an acronym for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. Um, and they, they just give the acronym. And it's essentially uh, people getting together and coming to an agreement on how we're going to be naming these compounds. So, you know, if, uh, if I'm naming a compound in America, it's the same thing as naming a compound in Nigeria or naming the same compound in Poland. We all have an agreement uh, on that. So that's what ultimately what we're saying. In UPAC nomenclature, uh, in this case for alkanes, um, uh, in alkane structure, there are two components to identify when we get into organic nomenclature, always. That, that first thing we're going to be doing is separating these two components because it's going to be important uh, when, to, in, to come up with the proper UPAC name. The first thing that we're going to be, uh, be identifying here are the, is the parent structure the parent structure on here. And this is just an example one. And typically, and we kind of already did this in the previous slide, the parent structure is, for our purposes right now, the longest continuous carbon chain. Longest continuous. Now, there are many, uh, we're going to find uh, examples, many structures where we can meander around many different uh, carbon chains, but it's always the longest one. So I could count on this uh, carbon structure right here. Notice it is written in line structure primarily. Uh, we count one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, and we'd have to keep going. It's like, well, let, let's try uh, another one. How about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons? Oh, well, that's different. That's a longer continuous carbon chain. However, what if we did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? That is the parent structure. We tried all possibilities, but the longest continuous one is the parent structure. So don't be fooled because sometimes these things are going to meander around and we're going to be uh, led to believe, well, the parent structure is always the one that's the horizontal one, as shown. Not always the case, just fair warning. In any event, this would be our parent structure, sort of circled right here. And that parent structure is then uh, uh, set apart. And once we have identified our parent structure, and I will circle it right here in red, everything else are considered substituents. Subs there are substitutions upon that parent structure. Typically, almost exclusively, substituents will be uh, either a halide, we see here, this is it's a halide. Remember, that was a type of functional group. Chloro, fluoro, bromo, iodo. Those were halides. Or more carbon connectivity. That is known as uh, alkyl connectivity. Alkyl. It sort of has that, that prefix of alkane. But YL means it's secondary to the parent chain. It's not an alkane chain, it's an alkyl 
octane. So this would be an example of an alkyl group branching off of our already designated parent structure. So for the remainder of this lecture, what we're going to be doing is just looking at uh, introducing, first of all, the, the parent structures we're going to be working with, because it could be infinite. All we got to do is how many carbons you want on there. We're going to tamp that down and only deal with up to 10 carbons. So the parent structures we're going to deal with, as well as what types of substituents, alkyl or halide substituents. We're not going to get into actual nomenclature until the next lecture, but this the remainder of this lecture is just to lay that out. So let's start with the parent structures. And those parent structures, as, as we said uh, before, are the longest continuous carbon chain. So what does that mean? We can go anywhere from one carbons to an infinite number of carbons. Well, no, we're going to stop at 10 carbons. I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, nice to you guys. So, so we're not going to go into having to memorize, uh, you know, 100 different uh, possible parent structures. It's only 10. So let's take a look at them. So we're <clears throat> our parent chain nomenclature uh, is with respect to uh, continuous linear uh, carbon chains up to 10 carbons. This, and that says here must be memorized. Well, you know, in the age of COVID here and with, with the age of uh, open book exams, apparently we don't have to memorize them anymore, do we? Uh, but uh, the, uh, you take my point perhaps. So all of these structures will be considered parent structures and form the base name of most alkane structures we'll be naming. Interestingly, they'll be forming the base name of uh, virtually all of the uh, molecules containing functional groups that we'll be naming. So we're on a bit of a, a, a steep learning curve uh, here where, where we have to introduce all this stuff. We'll be using it again down the road when we name aldehydes and alkenes and that sort of thing. Uh, but for now, this is the, the steep learning curve. Okay, so I've got this table set up. Uh, notice over on the left, we have the number of carbons in the parent chain uh, go, going downward from one to 10. Uh, and we're gonna introduce these at uh, one at a time. So for our, uh, if we have a parent chain of one carbon, one carbon gives CH4, we have our structure right there. Uh, it's name, methane, methane. So meth is our prefix. Meth always means one, one. Ane is our suffix, which means it is single bonded. It is an alk, ane, meth, ane. Fair enough. What about a two carbon uh, parent chain? That would be two carbons and show the structure right there. Two, isn't it a two carbon alkane is named, the parent structure is named ethane. Eth is always two. Meth is one, F is two, always. And notice the same suffix, A-N-E. You'll always see that for alkanes, all the way up to 10. We're gonna have the same suffix, A-N-E. Three carbons. So now notice uh, on my structure, I've moved over to line drawing here as opposed to throwing in all of the carbons and hydrogens I did before. That's just for ease of operation. But again, the th three carbons, we can see here, look, count the ends and the bends on this structure right here. Well, there's two ends and one bend, total of three carbons. Uh, so this would indeed be the line structure way of drawing that alkane. A three carbon alkane is known as propane. Prop is three. This might be a little uh, more uh, familiar to you. Get our propane gas on our, our gas grill. Going to go buy a tank of propane. That's what we're dealing with here. That is our three carbon uh, uh, continuous linear structure, uh, our, our parent structure. Four carbons. Butane. Butane. But is four. Always. Butane. Think of a butane lighter. Uh, th well, this is the stuff that is contained within a butane lighter, that hydrocarbon right there, butane. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, thus far, one, two, three, four carbons. <laughs> five carbons, now it starts to get a little more familiar. You can see if you will agree with me here. A five carbon continuous alkane uh, uh, chain, pentane, oh, pent, 
Well, pent is sort of like, you know, pentagon is a five-sided figure. Uh, that term pent or penta means five times. So that starts to make a little bit more sense now, right? Uh, pent, well, it's five. It's a five-carbon pentane. is a five-carbon alkane parent structure. Um, it's more straightforward than we saw with this previous four right here, meth being one, F two, prop three, and but four. That was sort of, uh, you know, well, I kind of got to remember that. Now we're into, uh, into these Greek prefixes that we've heard before, or may have heard before. Pentane, oh, five carbons. The sixth carbon analog, hexane, hexagon, uh, six. And we, th we think of this Greek prefix is familiar because hexa is six, hexane, six, uh, six carbons long. Now notice as I'm moving along, I, I'm drawing these uh, structures as well. Notice they're all linear and they're all gonna be considered parent structures eventually when we start to look at this in more detail. Seven carbon uh, parent structure, continuous uh, linear carbon structure, heptane, hept. Again, somewhat familiar, that Greek prefix, hept is seven. And if you counted the ends and the bends on this uh, line structure I've drawn here, you would indeed come out with seven. Eight, what's eight? Oct, remember? Octagon, that sort of thing. Octane, eight is octane, like the octane rating in your gasoline, you may have heard. This is what we're talking about, octane. Nine carbons go increasing by one carbon each time on these structures. Uh, nine carbons is nonane. Non is nine. Notice if all of the suffixes are A-N-E throughout. Uh, nonane is the, uh, is the uh, name of a nine carbon continuous uh, parent structure. Lastly, mercifully, 10 carbons. C10 H22, and I have the, the structure written right there in line drawing. 10 is dec, decane. Decane is the far we're, far as we're going to go. We could go further. 11 is undecane. 12 is dodecane. It's, that just gets very complicated. So for under the auspices of this class, we're going to go from 1 to 10 possible parent structures, and we're stopping at 10, stopping at decane. Okay, having... Uh, worked on our parent structures or de designated our parent structures, what is left are our substituents. Substituents that are basically branches in some manner off of a parent structure. Everything else besides the parent structure are considered substituents. And those substituents are either <clears throat> halides or alkyl groups. And we'll tackle halides first. Halides are halogen substituents uh, off of a parent chain. They're common fixtures. We see them frequently as, uh, as substituents on alkanes and many other uh, hydrocarbon parent groups. Um, we have four halides um, and our halogens, as we've seen here, there's uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Uh, so th those are how we see them. However, they're not given as when they're uh, as a substituent on a parent structure. It's not a fluorine group or a chlorine group. We take that, uh, that, that prefix, say for fluorine, we take fluor and we put an O on the end. Fluoro, that's a fluoro group off of that uh, alkane parent chain. Or a chloro, it's not a chlorine group, it's chloro. Not a bromine group, but a bromo or iodo. So those four, so as long as we put that O uh, 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 suffix on the end, that is the proper way to, uh, to express these things for halides. And that's pretty much it for halides. Uh, that's a very quick way of looking at that substituent class. We're going to spend the majority of our time uh, looking at um, our alkyl branching, actual carbon branching, because there's a little bit more to that. So let's take a look at that. Alkyl groups. Let's look at that, uh, that, uh, that term, alkyl. That's the prefix alk, A-L-K, is for alkane, alkane type branching, carbon-carbon single bond branching. But then we have that suffix Y-L. Well, it's because that Y-L is not an alkane branch, it's an alkyl branch. And that YL suffix means that it is secondary 
to the parent chain. It is a substituent off of an already designated parent chain. And the way these alkyl groups are named, we keep the same prefix. So, let, so follow me here. Over on the, on the left, we have a couple of actual compounds, parent structures that we looked at before, a one carbon parent structure known as methane. Why? Because meth is one, ane because it's an alkane. Second one are is a two carbon structure, ethane. Why? Well, eth is always two, ane, because we have that carbon carbon single bond. But what if we had a one carbon or a two carbon branch off of an already established parent chain? Well, we would keep the same prefixes, meth and eth, but we have to show that they are secondary, YL. So if we had a one carbon alkyl substituent, it would be meth, because it's one, but look there, YL, methyl, methyl group, means it is a one carbon branch on an already established parent chain. Notice how I've, I've drawn this right here, this little squiggle mark right here. That would signify the parent chain. That's the parent chain. And the, what is coming off of that parent chain would be that one carbon substituent. So that's why that's my use of squiggle. I could potentially also put an R group there. Remember that R group is a way of looking at uh, something that uh, uh, rest of the molecule that we don't care about. We, that could be uh, uh, substituted as, a, uh, a, a, as the parent chain as well. So what if we had a two carbon branch or a two carbon alkyl substituents? Well, we would keep the same prefix F because F is always two, but we put on YL, ethyl group, not an ethane group. It is an ethyl group because an ethane would mean ethane is the parent. That is the parent chain. An ethyl group means okay, I am a two carbon substituent secondary to an already established parent chain. That's ultimately how it works. So let's take a look at this. I've drawn a, a representative parent structure in line drawing and notice that uh, at all my bends now uh, would be considered carbons. These are carbons implied at all my bends and this the idea is this uh, parent structure keeps on going. So notice I have put a couple squiggles right there. I could put R if I wanted to, but these squiggles means it continues beyond me. So we're just, what it's saying is we're just looking at a particular portion of a potential parent chain, not numbering the chain, uh, but, but it just keeps on going. I'm using this as a template to perch, if you will, some of, the, uh, to, uh, some of these alkyl substituents. So we just looked at a, uh, a methyl substituent and an ethyl substituent. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Now, I've, I've done this in color coding here. So this is what a methyl substituent would look like in line drawing. So remember, uh, we look at the ends and the bends. Well, certainly we have, uh, we have an end here on our methyl group, one. That's one carbon. Very importantly, we don't count this carbon right here because that's already spoken for because it's part of the parent chain. We do not count that one. So thus, there is only one carbon in this branch and uh, that, that, we, uh, that, that is important to us. And if it's one carbon in that branch, it is a methyl group, methyl, not methane, methyl. So let's look at our two carbon branch. That was our ethyl group, ethyl. So how do I know there's two carbons in here? And I know I'm, I'm harping on this, but it's important. Ends in the bends. Well, there is an end, that's one carbon. There's a bend. That's two carbons. Very tempting to say, well, there's another bend over here. Isn't that three carbons? No. That third one that I just highlighted is part of the parent structure, and that's a no-go zone. It's only two carbons in this particular, uh, in this particular chain, uh, uh, substituent, in this alkyl group. So thus, 
it is an ethyl group. So sticking with our uh, ideas here of alkyl groups, we looked at a one carbon alkyl group that was a methyl group and a two carbon alkyl group that was an ethyl group, methyl and ethyl. And it should go without saying, or maybe not, that there is only one way, one type of branch I can, I can put forth with, a, with one carbon and two carbons. Only one way I can arrange them. That's a methyl or an ethyl. Once we start expanding our carbon number on these alkyl groups, they, we can inject, start injecting some diversity into their, uh, their connectivity. And that, so we're going to uh, uh, look at this when we're talking about three carbon alkyl groups and four carbon alkyl groups. And we're stopping at four, stopping at four, because as we go to five carbon, six carbon, the uh, extent of the diversity uh, just gets daunting. There's too many of them to keep track of. But uh, so <clears throat> my promise to you is any alkyl groups you will encounter in this course uh, will only be up to four carbons. So let's look at this. Three carbon alkyl groups. How could I, and notice I have my, uh, I have my uh, sort of template of a uh, parent structure here, probably more than 10 carbons. I'm not having you name this parent structure. I just needed a large structure upon which to draw these, uh, these alkyl groups. Uh, but again, they have squiggles on either end, and this basically means to say, like, this is just a template. Um, at each of these bends, there is a carbon atom there. Each of those carbons has two hydrogens attached, but it's line structure, as we learned before. So how could I arrange three carbons on this, on this, on this chain here? Well, one way to do it is always the linear fashion. Let's look at this. Uh, three carbons, and I know that's three carbons because I can count the ends and the bends. One, two, three not this one, right? That's part of the parent chain. So there are three of them. Three, as we know, is prope. Three is prope. So, uh, so we have up here the name of the, the, the structure, prope, but it's a propyl, propyl group, not a propane group, a propyl group. Why YL? Because it is secondary to the parent structure. And there's three carbons on there, propyl. But I'm going to submit to you that there is another way to arrange a three carbons as an alkyl group. And that would be as shown here. Notice one, two, three carbons. It's a propyl. Remember, not that one. That's part of the parent structure. Is that getting too repetitive? Well, the reason I do it is because students frequently make that connection. Wow, there's another, there's another carbon in there. There is not. There is three carbons to the, there as I've designated. So it must be a propyl, but it's a different connectivity than we saw on this other one. These are definitely different connectivities, so they have to have different names. And we accomplish this by putting a modifier on the front of uh, of the of propyl to show that it's different from the I guess you'd call it the regular old propyl. Um, we call this an isopropyl group. Isopropyl, propyl because it's three carbons. Iso because we have to throw in something to make it different from the regular old propyl group that we see over on the left hand side. So we have propyl and isopropyl, and those are the only two ways that we can arrange three carbons as a branch off of a parent structure, propyl and isopropyl. Really helps to get a visual of this. Organic chemistry is all about visuals, and we can see this, so I, that's very different. So this is my linear structure. Iso we're gonna see is synonymous with sort of, it looks like a letter V a lot. At the very, very end is V, so I don't know, what that means. It helped me when I was uh, uh, sitting in your seat, but ISO, I always say, okay, there's a V at the end, must be ISO. We'll see that again when we look at our four carbon alkyl groups. So speaking of which, let's look at the, the different ways that we can arrange four carbons as a branching structure on a, uh, on a parent structure. 
Well, the first best way to do it is always that one, uh, that linear way. Uh, again, how many carbons? Let's count. One, two, three, four. The ends and the bends. And I've already known I'm not touching that one because that, I've already told you a hundred times that's part of the parent structure. So four. What is four? Four is but. But is four. Remember butane was a parent structure with four carbons? In this case, it's not a parent structure. It is a four carbon linear branch. So it's not butane. It is butyl, Y-L, to show it's secondary to that parent structure. Butyl group. Just like we up here with the three carbon linear one, we had a propyl group. It is a butyl group. Fair enough. Four carbons, but is a branch, Y-L, butyl. But there are a number of ways now that we can uh, arrange four carbons as a branch on an alkyl, on, on, a, in, uh, on a parent structure. Let's look at one of them. Oh, what do we see here? Well, I know it's four carbons, ends in the bends. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Must be a butyl group. Must be. But what type of butyl group? We see, see on, the, on the end here, I've already given the name, but check what's on the end. Looks like a V to me. Isobutyl, because that V on the very end. Isobutyl. So we have a butyl, so that linear one, Another way to put four carbons is different, isobutyl, or isobutyl group. Couple more ways of arranging four carbons. I'll show them to you here. A sec butyl group. That is definitely different uh, in, in manner and form than the butyl or the isobutyl, so it has to have a different name. It's still butyl. Why? Because it's four carbons. One, two, three, four carbons not that parent structure one. Four carbons must be butyl, but it's arranged, we're gonna call that a sec butyl group. The reason for the term, the, the modifier, S-E-C, sec, will become somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, understood uh, on the next slide. But for now, I'm gonna show you the last way that we can put four carbons together as a branch off of a, uh, off of a parent structure. And we have this sort of uh, a cross way of putting things. Let's count how many carbons. Ends in the bends. One, two, three, four. Right in the center. That's a carbon. That's a bend. Four carbons. It must be a butyl group. Okay, butyl is in the name, but we call it a tert butyl group. Tert. The reasoning for tert will become uh, become a little more understandable in the next slide. But uh, if you wanted a real rudimentary way of looking at it, tert, well, the group itself sort of looks like a lowercase t, if you wanted to put it that way. So that's one way to remember it. I don't have a whole uh, lot of ways of remembering the sec butyl group, so you're sort of on your own with that. But let's uh, let, let, let's take a look at why uh, we, ha we have these names, at sec and tert, and we've already described iso as the V, but uh, it's a way of classifying alkyl groups. This term classification. Let's take a look. Okay, so here I've got exactly what was on the other slide, um, but I just put it down, uh, down below as a template to what we're going to be looking at next. And that is uh, known as the classification of alkyl groups. Classification. Remember we did classification before uh, with carbon types? What type of carbon is this classified as? And it came out as either primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on. Um, so carbon atoms in alkanes are classified according to the number of other, other carbon atoms that they are directly attached to. And this is ultimately how the, these would work. So each of these now, uh, in blue here, I'm showing the uh, all, our, 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 uh, our three carbon, four carbon, two and one carbon alkyl groups that we just learned uh, on the past two slides. And we can classify these as either primary, secondary, or tertiary. So the way to do this is to first, there's two steps. The first step is to identify the carbon directly attached to the parent chain. And I'm gonna do that down on butyl here, See, right down here. 
That's the carbon that's directly attached to the parent chain. And then I am going to identify the number of non-parent carbons directly attached to it. Well, that would be this one. That's a non-parent carbon. It has to be directly attached, right next door, non-parent. Non so we couldn't pick that one. Why? Because that is part of the parent structure, remember? So on this case, uh, we have, we, we picked out in red here, the carbon directly adjacent or attached to the parent structure. And we asked how many other carbon atom, non-parent carbon atoms is that carbon directly attached to? Well, that's in yellow. There's one. So thus, this would be a primary alkyl group. Let's do that again on the, on the next one over on isobutyl. Let's identify the, the carbon directly attached to the carbon to the parent chain. There it is. How many other non-parent carbons is it directly attached to? Non-parent, directly attached to? One, only one. So thus, this would also be primary, a primary alkyl group. All right, let's look over next door at secbutyl. Here is the carbon directly attached to the parent structure. And now we're going to ask how many other non-parent carbons is it directly attached to? One, two directly attached to. So this would be a secondary alkyl group. Now the term sec butyl has a little more currency because it is the butyl group, which is a secondary alkyl group. Last one in, in the four carbon series. Here is the carbon directly attached to that parent structure. And we find that we have one, two, three carbons, non-parent carbons directly attached to it. Thus, it is a tertiary alkyl group. That is where the term tert comes from on tert butyl. Let's uh, finish up the ones up at the top again uh, on propyl. We have, here's the carbon directly attached to the parent structure. It is adjacent to one non-parent carbon, uh, and thus it would be a primary alkyl group. Isopropyl, there's that carbon directly attached to the parent structure, and it has two non-parent carbons directly adjacent to it. So thus it would be a secondary alkyl group. Getting down to the smaller ones, our ethyl group. Remember our two carbon one? Here's the carbon directly attached to the parent chain, and it has one non-parent carbon connected to it. It is a primary alkyl group. But lastly, let's look over at the lowly methyl group and, and see if we can uh, uh, find something here. The lowly methyl group has, here's the carbon directly attached to the parent structure. How many other non-parent carbons are attached to that? Well, None. So the methyl group actually defies classification. It is not primary, secondary, or tertiary. It just simply defies classification. So watch for that. 